Amen? It is relational. This is based on a relationship. This is not based on a contract, rather, but a covenant. Amen? And there's a big difference. You're not signing a contract with God. God has a covenant with you. Do you understand? That He has a covenant with you. And this covenant takes effect 24-7. There is no gap. I like the, the quote that Ken put, put up there on the projection screen last Sunday. Right? About our giving. <laughs> that it, what happens if God, you know, will determine His, His provision for us based on our giving? How much you give to Him? Alright, this is how much I'm going to give you. That's scary. What if He would make it, uh, but He would decide what to do with you because of what you do with Him? That's still scary. Because one of the biggest problems we have in, our, in, in living our Christian lives is to be consistent. It's consistency and faithfulness. I have yet to see, uh, to, to, to know or to hear a Christian will say, you know, Pastor, I don't have a problem with consistency. I don't have a problem with faithfulness because I, I've been always consistent and I've been always faithful. And if you can say that, that's why we need to learn to serve the Lord with consistency. Because a lot of times there's gaps. There's times when we're not thinking and focusing on Him, but we're focusing on ourselves. And when we focus on ourselves it brings a lot of negativities. Because now you begin to what? To look at your own uh, problems and obstacles and even miseries. And you feel bad for yourself. Because you get disappointed with self. I get disappointed with self a lot of times. So what's the, so what's the solution then? You start looking at others? What will happen to you if you start looking at others and just focusing on what they do and what they are? You get disappointed. And at times, you get offended. <laughs> right? Because now again, our eyes would not really, you know, uh, uh, have a, a large vision of the good things that people see. When it comes to the good things that people see, we most of the time overlook. And we don't recognize, we don't notice. But if they make a mistake, that's when our eyes, you know, <laughs> our vision becomes larger. Because human tendency, human nature allows us to, you know, to magnify the faults and mistakes of others. To make a big issue out of a small, a, a small offense or whatever, small mistake. That's our problem. We tend to become critical, judgmental. We compare, we compete, and we want to be superior. That's because of pride. That's the result of our sinful nature within us. And so we have a problem. So if we can't focus on ourselves and, and look at others, what do we do? What did Jesus say? What, do, what did Jesus say? That we look to God. The book of Hebrews tells us that we should fix our eyes on Jesus. The book of Colossians, it, it tells us, right, that we should fix our eyes on things that are above. If you then be risen with Christ, then seek those things things which are above. Amen? Amen? Recognize and acknowledge the spiritual blessings up above according to Ephesians chapter number 1. So look up. Psalm 121, the Bible tells us, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Because that's where help comes from. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. So serve the Lord. Doesn't matter, comfortable or not, convenient or not. We have to be consistent. We have to continue, you know. <coughs> and thirdly, according to verse 9, a servant should not expect consolation. Now this is tough. Should not expect consolation. Are you familiar with the word incentivize? I used to think that's not the correct English term. But it is. Incentivize becomes a verb. Right? Incentive. Isn't and then the verb form of it is incentivize. <coughs> which means what is synonymous to it? To what? Incentivize is to what is synonymous to it? Come on. Mr. Manager, 
how do you incentivize incentivize your employees? All right. So give them what? Yeah, motivation. Promote them. Increase. Pay increase. Incentivize. Inspire them. Motivate them. Encourage. That's what you do. But do we always get that? That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. And here, after going all out and working from sunrise you know, to sundown, the servant is no doubt tired, exhausted. Have you guys ever observed a farmer working in a field? Or have you lived <coughs> in a setting like that, in a rural setting? Among farmers, I had, and probably some of you. I read a, a statement not, not too long ago that we should be thankful for farmers. Because if there's no farmers in this world, what will happen to us? There'll be no food in the grocery stores. No rice and potatoes. No veggies. And that's fine with you, but no, because you're, you're a meat lover. I told him one day we're at a buffet, hey, come on, there's a lot of good vegetables. Oh, Pastor, that's just decoration. <laughs> I traveled with him in Genesis to on a mission trip. First day we went to a restaurant. I didn't know that he only eats meat and nothing else. No veggies for him, just meat. And then I found out Genesis only eats what? Vegetables. <laughs> and I said, now I got a problem here. <laughs> but you see, without farmers, how are we going to live? But it is hard. And I know that for the most part, farming like that, like working with a, with a working animal, right? It's usually done by male. Farmers are usually male. Because it requires a lot of physical effort, strength. Under the heat of the sun or when it's raining. Oh, I lived in a setting like that when I was in high school. I was exiled into my mom's hometown. <laughs> it is not easy. Look at verse 9. Would he thank the servant because he did that with what he was told to do? The implied answer is what? Is it strong? No. Now, the word thank here means to have gratitude or to be grateful. And, and the idea is if the master expresses gratitude, it could be const construed, as, is, or construed as a debt that must somehow be settled to even the score. So now, if, if the master is thankful like that, the servant would be feeling, so then oh, I deserve bigger compensation, right? <laughs> a bigger reward or whatever. So this is... As far as, you know, our relationship with God is concerned, it is just absurdly arrogant. Because look at this verse in, in Job chapter number 22 and verse number 2. Job 22 two points out, and I read, Can a man be a benefit to God? Will God be God without us? Does God really need us for His existence? Are we vital to His existence? Are we essential to His existence? Will He be the, the great God that we know now without us? Huh. Does He need our money? Wow. See, some, some of us maybe think that God somehow owes us for all that we've done for Him. All the years that I've labored, oh, I deserve, you know, a good life. Sometimes that thought comes in. We think of what we deserve. And, and the Pharisees believe in that. Their performances, the way they, li they live, their deeds put God in their debt. <laughs> they thought that God owes them something. This kind of thinking gets us in deep trouble because God, God, listen, doesn't owe us anything. With God, you cannot say, you can never say, I deserve to be given this. Remember when Peter was called by Jesus, he left his boat, he left his ambition, he left his profession, right? Even left his home. Was Peter married? Absolutely, because he had a mother-in-law who was sick, and Jesus healed her. <coughs> healed her. So when he left everything, at one point, 
he asked Jesus, So Lord, we've left everything and followed you all these years. So what is there for me? Didn't he ask that question? He did. What is there for me? What am I going to get out of following you and serving you? 